Hey Taylor, this is this is Joe from Biggest Geekus. Uh, just listened to your latest episode, your unboxing that got curtailed to a degree by your <laughs> wonderful, wonderful children. Um, got a real kick out of that, and I'm looking forward to a more detailed um, unboxing or review of the materials we received, and uh, we really appreciate all that you contribute to our show with your call-ins. Well, have a good one, and uh, delve on. Fate Accelerated, printed by Evil Hat Productions, 2013. To start with the cover, it is blue in color, a kind of happy blue, and it's paperback. So not particularly sturdy, not particularly unsturdy, a uh, little bit bigger than A4. I am outside with the boys at the moment, so let's see, it would be... Uh, da, 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 da. One and a half plastic shovels tall by one plastic shovel across. It is marked as $5. I don't know if that is still the case, but it was in 2013. And it's got a couple characters hanging out that, honestly, I really like the art style. It is halfway between anime and a sort of a traditional American illustration. It reminds me a lot of teenager, uh, teenager action cartoons from the, uh, from the late 90s into the early 2000s before the current minimalist trend of cart American animation took over. And so I'm recording this while chasing a child around outside. Can we go in the backyard? Judah is in the backyard. But I actually do, I don't know if I, rem if I said this yet or not, I really do like this art style. It's got a sort of nostalgia to it. It's got a mix of kind of a fun, cartoony vibe and a nod to actual talent, which is absent in a lot of American animation. I will check the credits. The interior and cover art appears to have been done by Claudia Cangini. Apologies if I mispronounce, but in any case, very well done, Claudia, on the artwork. There are five names on the cover, compared to what appears to be eight in the interior page. We will go down the interior page. I had originally assumed that the names of the characters on the cover were the names that were on the cover underneath them, but then I realized that that was not a temporal matchup, so silly me. All right, reading here, it looks like it's crediting Rob Donahue and Fred Hicks with the original Fate system. Uh, let's see. And then in this book, some writing and refinement was done by Clark Valentine. Uh, some clarity and editing was done by Amanda Valentine. Uh, don't know if they're related, but I can say the clarity so far, you know, pretty pretty bad. I mean, I can I can I'm holding my hand on the other side of the book, and I cannot see my hand at all. Maybe if I move some of the pages. Oh wait, I, I'll never mind. That's that would be transparency. Clarity is something else. Apologies, Amanda. Then, lastly, we credited Fred Hicks with concept writing and layout, Mike Olson with system editing, and Claudia, aforementioned Cangini, for the cover art and interior. So it looks like there are not as many names on the interior as I thought. I'd said eight, so the same one got repeated a couple times, but that's okay. With that out of the way, let's move in and see some of the content. In the Getting Started page, uh, well, first we have some art and credits, but in the first content page of the book, the fifth page, they have a section on getting started. It's a little bit of an intro, your typical, this is what a die is and what a die does, but it's useful in this sense because the it introduces fate dice. So 
It doesn't. Cr uh, there. It is essentially a three-sided die with a plus, a minus, and a blank. Uh, it credits that the original name was Fudge Dice, which that's a good thing that they renamed it. I remember buying the Fudge Dice originally and cracking a tooth, but the it also gives some guidance on how to use a regular six-sider, uh, namely one or two, three or four or five or six, corresponding to each various state the die can be in. So you have a way to play without the accoutrement. They also have the they also have a link to evilhat.com. You don't have to. We're just going to put it there. They have a link to where you can buy them, and there's apparently another product, a, de a deck of fate, where it's a deck of cards mimicking the probability. That's interesting. Uh, they say it's going to come out in 2013 or 2014. Uh, I do not intend to look up whether it is out, but listeners, you are welcome to call in. Similarly, uh, something I did not look up in the episode like a month or two ago now, where Kevin of the Red Caps came on, I said that actor and entertainer Danny Kay was Canadian. That was mistaken. I said I wasn't going to look it up, but I got two... Oh, those are birds? They're flying? I was too curious and did, in fact, look it up. Danny Kay was born in the good old U.S. of A., my mistake, I will try to be better about my 1940s and 50s entertainers going forward. Back to the book in question. Now that we have officially got our child toilet out into the front yard uh, where it belongs, going into the next portion of the book, it talk oh, Micah, leave the sprinkler alone, please. It talks a little bit about the prime directive of the book. Fate Accelerated Edition is all about telling stories. Oh, excuse me. You create a group of characters and follow them through some imaginary adventure that you all take turns telling little parts of. Therein that follows are some notes about role-playing, and it gets into a section about character concepts. First we have aspects. An aspect is defined as a word, phrase, or sentence that describes something centrally important to the character. So... In other games, it may be a uh, mantra or, Oh, no, no, rocks! Baby, no rocks in the yard! Your character has three to five high-concept aspects, and they're, I guess they say they're going to go into detail on that on a future page. A high-concept is the singular phrase that neatly sums the character up, who they are and what they do. And additionally... Additionally, uh, we are apparently following the Baby Chick, which is an animatronic Easter toy that doesn't have any batteries in it. Uh, trouble. Next, decide on the thing that gets you into trouble. It could be a personal weakness or a recurring enemy or an important obligation. It gives an example, but I'm going to try to uh, tag one up here. Uh, let's see, my high concept is I am a animatronic chicken, underaged. My primary drive is to sing little songs when people push my hand, and the trouble is that I am out of batteries. Oh, did you fall down? A doggy. Okay, yep, there's a doggy. So, that, there's my first Fate Accelerated character, the baby chick. Next, it goes on to talk about approaches. Approaches represent a mechanism, your primary modus operandi of how your character tackles problems. There are six of them. Uh, some of them appear... No, no, Baby Chick does not need to go in the car. They don't seem to tie into the traditional uh, six, strength, intelligence, wisdom, whatnot. Uh, there are... There are a couple of them that could line up, but then there are a couple of them that either overlap or don't. So what I'm thinking is that this is, not knowing that this is not a OSR type game, I'm not going to try to hold it to that standard. So each character gets to choose a good, f two fair and two average, one mediocre. So this is all bonuses, uh, all pluses. So there, there exists... 
poor and terrible, uh, but from this is only accessible via what's called the ladder. Oh, okay, we're following the baby chick again. Presumably, and I'm sure that this is going to... Micah, can we come to the backyard? Presumably this will come up in a future portion of the book. You'd think I would have read the whole thing before I talked about it, but I didn't. Anyway, presumably, there's going to be various modifiers to how good you are at the situation at hand, and then you would get a bonus or a penalty accordingly. That would go up and down this ladder, which ranges from minus 2 to plus 8. Next, we have a concept called stunts and refreshes. A stunt is a special thing for your character, typically resulting in a plus two bonus, uh, and there's a list of them later in the book, and a refresh. That is the number of fate points. Aha, uh -huh. here is the, here is the nomenclature that forced me to rename my advancement system in my own faux SR homebrew. But I digress. The refresh is the number of fake points you begin the game session with. And uh, presumably, it's going to tell me what fake points do in a bit. <laughs> Continuing into the book, we have the chapter entitled, How to Do Stuff. That's some top-notch editing, and I mean that. Uh, this is a very great chapter title. Hats off to you, Mr. Mike. Moreover, this appears to be outlining the core mechanic of the game. By the look of it, you can roll your fate dice, or you can draw from your fate deck, and then you count the number of successes. The aforementioned plus signs add one to your pool, and minus signs subtract. So it is possible to get a number between minus four and plus four, depending on how well you do. The number of successes is then compared to a desired number of successes that's either set by the game master or rolled by an opponent in the case of an opposed roll. The player number is modified by their aspects, I tried to say abilities there, but trying to stick to the nomenclature of the game, and then it has degrees of success. If you are less than the target number, then you fail. Tie is uh, if it's equal, greater than, and if you succeed by three or more, it's a critical success. Next, we move into the section of the rules called actions. Actions are a way to execute on the narrative influence your character is trying to exert. There are four basics. You can create an advantage by creating or discovering aspects. You can create an advantage on an aspect you already have. Uh, you can overcome a situation. You can attack, or you can defend. That's not four. I guess that's what you get for trusting the math in a narrative story game instead of a number cruncher. To start off, we have the creation or discovery of an advantage. It took me about four or five takes to really kind of grok this. So, creating an advantage, defined as anything you do to try to help you or your friends. Oh, the bunny went in there? Oh, okay. The, the bushes are his house. Two. If you, so you roll the dice, and if you have a failure, as described earlier in the dice section, you don't create or discover an aspect, but your opponent gets to invoke the aspect you were trying to. If you have a tie, then you get a boost, which is a meta-currency. If you succeed, then you and an ally get a boost. And if you succeed with style, a critical success, then you may invoke it twice. So essentially two boosts instead of the one. Uh, alternatively, you can take advantage of an existing aspect where it's a little simpler. Uh, failure, you gain no benefit. Uh, tie or success is one free invocation of the aspect, and a critical success is two. So pretty straightforward there, but so there's no boost uh, if you're using something you already have, but you do get a boost if you discover a new one. Next, it goes into the overcome action. The overcome action is a catch-all for 
overcoming. The examples given in the book are picking a lock, escaping from handcuffs, jumping across a chasm, or etc. Failure, uh, that means that you simply fail, uh, or you can succeed at a cost, which is something that the referee and you, the player, negotiate. Uh, if you tie, then you attain the goal, but at a minor cost, again, kind of, uh, I guess, a negotiation aspect. Success succeeds, obviously, and succeeding with style implies a success and you gain a boost metacurrency. Next up are attack and defend. These are pretty straightforward. Uh, failure means you miss. Uh, a tie gives you a boost. And success means that you hit. Defend at the same time. Then you avoid or don't avoid whatever is coming at you. A point where this deviates from another more mechanical given game. Yep, the, do the people are walking a dog. Is uh, you then choose an approach. Recall earlier we talked about approaches. These represent uh, bonuses that you get for doing something carefully or forcefully and so on. And you have to narratively describe what you're doing in a way that makes sense. Though, thinking about it, I kind of do this in old school games. Uh, you describe narratively what you're doing and your chances of success are based on how much that description makes sense. So, that less the case, I guess, for BX, but more the case for... You need to hold my hand? I guess I will hold hands for a bit and record again in a moment. Damage is measured less in hit points and more in stress. And by less, I mean there is no such thing as hit points in this game. Instead, your character starts with three stress boxes, and um, I can vouch that I have two stress boxes. Uh, one of them is running in the front yard, and one of them is moving our trash cans around. So I would probably be curious if there was a way to change out how many stress you get, but we'll get into it in a minute. Um, that said, in sh the short version is once you don't have any stress left, then you are taken out in a narrative way. This doesn't mean that you get killed. It, what it means is you're no longer involved in the scene at hand. The consequences of uh, getting knocked out like that vary based on the situation and are rated from mild, moderate to severe and appear to be uh, less solid and more fiat, which makes sense because this game is trying to tell a story, not trying to be fun. Not trying to be a board game or a war game. That's the core of the game, the core of your stats and resolution. But how do I advance? Well, it uh, appears to be m driven by milestones. So you have a minor milestones, uh, which occur at the end of a session of play, or you have a m significant milestone, which occurs at the end of a scenario or plot event. Uh, there's a picture here of somebody getting a medal from the king, and a major milestone, which, quote, should only occur when something happens to shake up the campaign. Each of these different milestones offer different options of character advancement. So you can do stuff like clearing injuries or uh, changing your character concept or uh, switching the ratings of your bonuses as part of uh, a different type of milestone. So I don't know if you can trade them. So if I hit significant, can I do the minor? But then again, I don't know if I would want to because the thing I get for a significant milestone is significantly better. But, so there's no unified approach, there's no unified tract that you'll follow like there might be in a class-based game. But instead, you improve your character over time as appropriate to the narrative. Now, you may have noted I slowly stopped talking about rules in detail and have been moving more into concepts, and I think that's because I've realized as I'm recording that you probably don't care to have someone who doesn't know what they're talking about read you how to play a game that he has no intention of playing. So, instead I want to focus a little bit more on physical aspects of the book. Um, I'm, let's see, what do I have at hand? Uh, the paper weight, I can't tell. It's a light book. It's only uh, it's only 40 or 50 pages. It is 
single column, so one set of text. That makes sense because I think double column doesn't work as well when you have a smaller book like this. Uh, the point of having two columns or more is to guide the eye. It's a lot faster to read a quick line, uh, that is a shorter line, than it is to read a longer one. It's the same number of words, but for some reason it just helps. There are some character sheets at the back, some reference char charts at the back. That's always helpful. And each of the pre-generated sample characters has art associated with them. There's also a picture. So I, I've been talking about art a lot. And I've been harping on the art. And you're probably thinking, well, if you like games like BX or Old School Essentials, why do you like the art in this book? Well, the art is very, very different than in this book. But the key behind art is that it needs to convey the tone of what you're trying to accomplish. While it's true, this art would not fit at all into an OSR module or a supplement, this art tells the story of what this game is trying to be about. Uh, for, there's a picture of a galleon uh, floating through the clouds and one of the main pirate-themed characters on a hand glider being chased by what appear to be uh, aerial shark creatures. That's glorious. The previous page has a picture of a giant robot getting kicked in the chest by what appears to be a, a monk archetype. This game isn't trying to be anything specific, but instead is supposed to kind of evoke that sense of anything. You can build what you want with this game, and you can tell the story that you want to tell with this game. And the art, while, like I said, it's not... It's not old school, and it's not something that I would hang on my wall. The reason I like it as much as I do is because it fits. I think I figured out what you're supposed to accomplish, the experience you're supposed to have with this game, and the art complements that experience. Now, there is some reuse. Uh, so, for example, the cover is just a color version of several pieces of black and white that are uh, copy-pasted into the book. Uh, specifically, uh, on the back, there is a redhead with a gyrocopter. That precise same picture is used for Bethesda Flushing PhD on page 43. It is literally the same picture, except one is in grayscale inside. So there's a little bit of copy-paste. I don't mind that. She appears in other places in different garb and different costume, so I think it fits. Sure, maybe you wanted to do something more big, uh, something more uh, original for the cover, but th this is being advertised as only costing $5. I have not gone on to drive through or wherever to see if it's still $5, but the fact is, this is not intended to be expensive, and I'm not going to hold something that minor against the publisher. In terms of usability, uh, there's a lot of cross-referencing. So in the margin, when they introduce a concept, they will tell you what the heading is and what the page it's on of the corresponding concept. For example, on page 28, they're talking about uh, invocations of aspects, and it talks about sometimes you can invoke an aspect for free, such as when you succeed with style. In the margin, succeed with style, page 13. Alternatively, you can cause a consequence through an attack, blah, blah, blah. A boost is a special kind of aspect that gains one free invocation, but then vanishes. And then it says boosts, page 26. That's pretty helpful. Uh, I think that because it's a small book, it works really well. I try to make inline annotations like that when I'm publishing, uh, I say publishing, uh, when I hit the export to PDF button on LibreOffice and then put it in Google Docs. But uh, anyway, I, I try to do the same thing to make those kind of cross-references, especially in a shorter form. So, all in all, the art and the layout complement the game. They make it fairly easy to reference in the book. Uh, Judah, put that back. Don't put the dirt in the grass. Okay, we're no longer digging up the flower beds. We're playing with an airplane. Where was I? Would I play this game? No, I would not. It's not designed as a game per se. This is designed as a communal narrative experience. It's a way for you and your buddies to sit down and introduce some randomization to authoring a story. With that in mind, uh, I prefer, when I'm playing a game, to have a game in front of me, to have a sort of uh, implicit 
framework around which the experience takes place. Because, and why is that? Narratively, you can make stuff up, you can improvise and rule, because rulings is part of uh, old school play, but it... If your entire mechanic centers around rulings or negotiation, it becomes a social game, not an arbitrated exchange. The arbitration being the key. If I'm feeling happy one day, or if I've been a little more drinking than less, then a certain approach will work one day, but not work the other. So, from my experience, or to my preferences, having a more robust framework, and I think... I, I have not read a lot of story games, but it's my uneducated prejudice that a lot of story games will have less mechanics and more negotiation. Having a mechanical framework becomes necessary to overcome potential uh, one rapport. So if I know my, re uh, my GM, my referee, and I know what they like, I can do what they like and always succeed. Or, if uh, if I am a lawyer or a politician or other charisma-driven character by trade in real life, then all of a sudden, my character is far more effective at everything he does, regardless of the nature of the description. But again, that is just my inexperienced predisposition. I've been giving this game a pretty hard time for the whole review, and that's primarily for comedic effect. I've got a reputation to uphold after all, but at the end of the day, I wanted to end on a sort of fair note. The game is catering to a particular style of play, and that particular style of play is less centered around the mechanical and more centered around telling a story at the table. While I personally don't play for that part of the experience. I do understand that there are people out there who enjoy it. As such, hopefully that mechanical review, the commentary to art, layout, and price, etc. is uh, sufficient to help to guide whether you enjoy the play style it presents, whether this speaks to your interests and preferences in a source book, and helps to inform whether or not this is the game for you. With that in mind, I will leave you off to delve on, or in the event that you pick up this book instead of a Dungeon Delver, uh, may you ever evade the Sky Sharks. Hey Taylor, I'm glad you got my uh, uh, secret surprise and the unboxing. I feel kind of bad. I'm, if you're hearing Echo, it's I'm casting from my secret layer, so hopefully my attempt to poison your bookshelf, um, though it failed because you were too tricksy for that, um, yeah, I wanted to throw that your way. Think of it like a, if you guys do white elephant gift exchange, just pass it on, um, but it's not one of my favorites either, <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of apologize for sending it your way, but now it's your problem, dude. <laughs> my problem indeed. That said, I reject your apology. I think it was a wonderful gift. I very much appreciate that you sent it to me. Uh, I was actually intending to retain the shipping address on it and send you a Christmas card, but uh, then one of my little boys dumped apple juice all over the packaging and kind of uh, smudged it up. So I may have to reach out to you for that Christmas card stuff on an alternative mechanism. But it does leave me with a conundrum. What do I do with this book. I do want to put it to good use and I know that I'm not going to run it so who else, who better to run it than James Schrall of a Subclass Act. He'll be able to showcase the system and he will be able to explain in a way that's entertaining to listen. So I'm actually typing that out to him right now. Hey James, this is Taylor of Cleric Swear Ringmail. I uh, just wanted to see if you were interested in a free copy of Fate Accelerated. I thought you might be a good character to showcase the system on your podcast. And I know you said you were on the lookout for new systems. Okay, he's he's typing back. Let's see what he has to say. Taylor, go f*** yourself. Do you think I'm insane sending you my home address? 
you can take that book and shove it up your... Oh, nice! That is a nice thought. I'd, I'm actually probably going to use Fate Core as the next system for the podcast. So, ah, foiled. It looks like he already has a copy, and he may be giving it a shot in the upcoming weeks. Uh, spoilers behind, but we will see... Uh, we will see if that comes to fruition. Thank you, James, for the consideration, at least, and it's interesting to know that great minds appear to think alike as uh, you're diving into the same system I was going to dump on you. But, uh, again, alas, what do I do with this book? Listeners, do you have an idea? Should I have my own contest and send this out? Should I send this to a particular reviewer or podcaster that you would prefer to have it? Give me a call. Clerics wear ringmail on anchor.fm. I'm curious to know what you'd like me to do with it, and I will be more than happy to put it to good use. In the interim, in the interest of leaving on a high note, I will let Jason Connerly of Nerds Variety RPG Cast take us out. Hey Taylor, Jason here. I just want to say you're obviously doing D&D wrong. Um, magic and succubuses are definitely parts of some games and the, the, and, and the result of some games. So it may, maybe just are using the wrong rule book. Maybe you're not reading it backwards properly. As far as my calls about quitting Carl's games and all that, that was all joke. So Carl, if you hear this months later, know that a- after our relationship is totally shattered, know that it was a joke and, that you you cut it off for no reason. Okay, talk to you guys later. Fun trivia, I actually got a chance to talk to Carl about it the day that the episode dropped. This is Carl of the GMologist Presents. He, in his real life, travels for work on occasion and made it into a township that was not too far away from me. So I packed up, drove down, and was able to get breakfast and hang out with him for a few hours before his, uh, his work caught up with him. And the instant we sat down, uh, uh, he went in for a handshake, and I gave him a hug instead. Surprise, Carl. And surprise for anyone else who mistakenly agrees to meet with me in a sojourn to Florida. And the second thing that happened was he said that he had just listened to your episode, and we were chuckling about the interchange between... So, as always, thank you, Jason, for clarifying, and, like I mentioned last episode, that is, of course, all tongue-in-cheek. We are all good buddies on the Audio Dungeon server. Uh, We've played in each other's games before, and, by and large, we give each other a hard time, because that's what buddies do. In terms of meeting Carl, I know that I said I was going to let Jason take us out, but I'm not consistent. Let's see what he has to say about that subject. Hey, Taylor, it's been a long day. I'm in Tampa now. (laughs) We're early this morning. I met you for breakfast at uh, the local Cracker Barrel in Gainesville. So really cool to meet you. It's kind of neat that we also had a nerdy waitress who plays D&D every Thursday and has even not scheduled classes on Friday so she can have her game on Thursday. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. It's a a nerdy world out there, isn't it? Um, Again, great to meet you. I uh, hope to be back in this part of the woods, or swamp as it were, um, in the future, and we can hang out, and I can meet the fam. They sound great, and it's awesome, and I can tell um, that you really appreciate your family, and and you communicate that to your friends, which is awesome. Great to meet you again. Careful. I kid a little, but my kids can be terrifying. When we came home from the grocery store the other day, one of them was a quarter mile up the road before I was able to get the groceries in the house and on the table and then start chasing him down. So I guess uh, if, if and when that happens, make sure to wear your Nikes. In the interim, I appreciate your patience with me, Carl. I'm glad you had a good impression, despite my inability to remain cogent. (laughs) To set the stage for the listener, uh, I met up Carl for breakfast. It was about maybe 6, 7 a.m., but 
I had the bright idea of staying up late the night before playing a Kalmata game with our mutual buddy Jason Hobbs, and then one of my twins had decided right around 2 that I needed to wake up and cuddle him back to sleep for the morning. So I was running on about 3 hours of sleep that night, and I had not had coffee until that first cup that our nerdy waitress had given us. To speak to that... That was definitely very cool. That is not something that has happened to me in the past. More stage setting for the listeners. I had worn a bright red beholder shirt to make myself more identifiable to Carl. I had bought it specifically for the occasion. Don't tell him that. She came out. She saw the beholder shirt, uh, poured some coffee for us, and then said, I love your shirt. So we asked her if she played, and I did give her a bit of a hard time on the audio dungeon. I do not believe she is a member, but she, the reply was in the affirmative, and I love Critical Role. Aforementioned hard time was probably inappropriate, albeit funny, because what followed we did talk about. She had her campaign night coming up that Thursday. She had taken Friday off class and worked so that she'd be able to play it, and I distinctly remember back when I was in college doing the exact same thing. And again, this is not a thing that was common for me back in the day. This is not a thing that is common for me now to run into random people who enjoy the hobby and are willing to talk about it with others. I like that it is becoming a thing that can happen now. I like that the stigma has been taken off, and I like that people are getting into the hobby, even if they play hmm, editions of the game and styles of the game that I don't necessarily get into myself. As two takeaways, for the 5% of my audience that is not middle-aged and married, uh, there are women out there who share your interest in gaming. And second takeaway, it was a lot of fun, Carl. I'm looking forward to, in the event that you travel out our way again, being able to catch up with you again, and uh, maybe one day being able to head out to North Texas and get some more gaming on. We will see what happens. Next year, my wife and I are expecting a newborn, and that newborn will only be four months old at that time, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it next year, but we can always try. Thank you for touching base with me uh, prior to your trip. Thank you for putting up with the Cracker Barrel. I know I said I wanted to take you somewhere local, somewhere more fun, and next time I will. But regardless of culinary accommodation, it was a lot of fun to meet and greet, a lot of fun to catch up, and it was a lot of fun to take that selfie, although I did have to stand on a bit of a step stool to get myself into the frame. I will look forward with bated breath to the next time we can hang out, and teaser teaser i look forward to having you on the show in this next upcoming episode that is for you the listener out in the distance we're going to have carl on from the geomologist presents in the next couple weeks and we're going to talk about some dnd between now and then Thank you, Carl, for calling in and for all of the above. Thank you, listeners, for listening. Thank you, Jason, for calling in. And thank you, Randy and Joe, for having me on the 50th episode, however many months ago that was. And thank you for sending that prize package down. And I do promise, sometime between now and the end of time, I'll get a chance to look at Labyrinth Lord 2. And with that, we just about wrap up the episode. Thank you, listeners, for listening. And between now and when you hear from me again, delve on. King Nothing, written by James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Kirk Hammond, performed on Metallica and included on album Load, released January 7, 1997, under label Electra, is property of its respective authors and labels. The snippet included herein is humor under fair use, U.S. Code 17, Section 107. Theme music used for the Clerics Wearing Mail podcast is adapted from Pursuing Darkness by artist X. Take Rux, released into the public domain and made available on freemusicarchive.org. Sound effects used in the making of this product retrieved from Mixkit.co, used under the Mixkit sound effects free license, or from SoundJ.com and used in accordance with the SoundJ.com terms of use. Segments recorded within a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device in conjunction with local vehicular safety legislation. The Clerics Wearing Mail podcast is an independently owned and operated product, released for educational and informative purposes under the Totally Steel this license. 
license, which is kind of like Creative Commons, except licensing. Clear swearing mail does not ascribe to nor endorse views or opinions expressed by Collins guests or even the host unless you think they're awesome, and thus does not assume any liability regarding the consumption or distribution of this podcast. By listening to the Clear Swearing Mail podcast, you agree to the provided term. Parties with questions regarding these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to reach out to Clear Swearing Mail at the prescribed methods provided on the Clear Swearing Mail blog. Parties dissatisfied with these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to go suck an egg.